Uh, thank you very much. I welcome everyone to this, the 13th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2014. I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices completely as they interfere with the systems and broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent. We're all here, so no apologies have been received. Item 1. I'm inviting the committee to consider a claim for witness expenses under item 3 and a work programme uh, paper, uh, work programme paper item 4 in private. Are you agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. And I'm inviting the committee to consider draft stage one report on the court's reform bill at future meetings, also in private. That's just the drafting. You agreed? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Item two, court's reform Scotland bill, stage one evidence. It's our final evidence session. And I welcome to the meeting Rosanna Cunningham, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and Scottish Government officials, uh, Cameron Stewart, Bill Team Leader, Hamish Goodall and Hazel Gibson, Policy Executives, Nicholas Duffy and Alistair Smith, Solicitors, Legal Directorate. That is a big team. There we are. And I understand that the Minister would like to make some opening remarks before we move to questions. Minister, please, please. please. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, and can I apologise for not being able to be here last week? I, I very much hope uh, and would feel guilty uh, if it turns out that uh, uh, having to remit this evidence session to this week has deprived you all of a, of a morning free. <laughs> so I hope that hasn't been the case. Um, <laughs> three mornings, they're not getting any. <laughs> right. Um, I should also just uh, um, make a declaration of interest for those that don't recall that prior to becoming uh, a Member of Parliament, I was a practising member of the Faculty of Advocates and uh, since election have been, and as far as I'm aware still am, a non-practising member of the Faculty of Advocates and given the nature of some of the discussion around this bill, it is um, uh, useful, I think, to remind people of that. Um, could I just also uh, remind people um, uh, that the Scottish Civil Courts Review, on which uh, a lot of this is founded, um, uh, found the current civil just justice system in Scotland to be slow, inefficient and expensive. I I'm not sure there would be many people who would have disagreed with that particular conclusion. As highlighted by Lord Gill, uh, our civil justice courts have remained relatively unchanged for over a century. And that's a very long time to leave something unchanged. Uh, therefore, we have to take action to ensure that the civil justice system becomes more accessible, uh, more affordable and more efficient for those people who need to resolve civil disputes. And this is now, of course, into the 21st century. Uh, we're uh, in the 21st century, effectively operating a system designed in the 19th century for the 19th century. Both the Civil Justice Advisory Group and the Civil uh, Courts Review identified a problem of disproportionate costs, particularly in regard to cases of relatively low financial value. It's not true, as some have claimed, that the need to ensure that legal costs are proportionate serves only the insurance industry. It serves all litigants in the court in the courts and indeed the public purse as well. The review concluded that only the most complex and legally difficult cases should be heard in the court of session, whereas most routine litigation should be conducted in the sheriff court by sheriffs using enhanced case management powers. At present, the amount paid to the lawyers on both sides of a low value claim in the court of session almost invariably exceeds the settlement figure of a claim or the amount awarded by the court. It is this factor which is disproportionate. If low-value cases are raised in the court of session, which involve the employment of counsel as well as the solicitor, then the costs will inevitably be higher in relation to the value of the claim than if the case was dealt with in the sheriff court, particularly as court of session fees for both advocates and solicitors are higher than sheriff court rates. The policy objective of the bill is to ensure that cases are heard at an appropriate level in the court structure, the right cases and the right courts. And the number of civil court cases being heard by the Sheriff Courts is actually decreasing substantially, down 43% uh, between 2008-9 and 2012-13. But paradoxically, the Court of Session has remained relatively stable and is still dominated by personal injury cases, with nearly 80% of the cases raised in the general department being personal injury. This bill ensures that actions where one party is suing another party for a sum of up to £150,000 will now have to be raised in the Sheriff Court. And this means that the resources of the court are being used efficiently 
and that the cost of litigation is reduced for all parties and for the public purse. The raising of the exclusive competence of the Sheriff Court goes hand in hand with the introduction of summary sheriffs and the establishment of a specialist personal injury court, which has been very generally welcomed. I'm aware there's been some debate about whether our proposals will restrict a litigant's access to counsel, their ability to take their case to the court of session, and whether the sheriff courts will be able to deal with the increase in the number of cases being referred there. I understand that Sheriff Principal Taylor was quite definite in telling the committee that he did not think that his recommendations would lead to sanction for counsel being granted on fewer occasions. Many cases are litigated without counsel, and automatic sanction for counsel could lead to sanction in many other non-personal injury cases where it was completely unnecessary and would lead to unnecessary cost. In terms of capacity, the proposals will only result in a 3% increase in caseload for the Sheriff Courts, and particularly in view of the drop in civil business in the Sheriff Courts in the last five years. We believe that they are well placed to handle the business, particularly as most of the cases will now be raised in the new specialist personal injury court. Finally, a great many experienced lawyer, uh, solicitors with expertise in personal injury law are perfectly capable of conducting personal injury cases in the Sheriff Court. Many, of course, already do that. Indeed, in terms of absolute numbers, more personal injury cases are currently heard in the Sheriff Courts than in the Court of Session. The Committee has heard evidence from a wide range of stakeholders. I'd like to remind the Committee that there was a very clear majority uh, support for the proposals and concepts detailed in the Government's consultation on the draft bill, which was carried out last year. And I'd also like to point out as well that the Law Society, the Faculty of Advocates and the SDUC have all expressed general support for the aims of this bill, even though they may have concerns about certain specific aspects. Uh, obviously, I'd be happy to answer any questions which the committee may have. I look around. I see no one. I think we may go home. No? Oh, no? Has somebody changed their mind? <laughs> <Yeah>. Elaine <laughs> has come in. Amazon's come in. And Margaret's come in. And Roddy's come in. Is that right? Oh, you didn't? Did... <laughs> I was actually Is that it's compulsory? compulsory. <laughs> it's compulsory now, Roddy. Right. Alison, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, you did have your hand up. I, oh, indeed. Yes. 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 Um, I want to um, go to something that we discussed last week with um, Lord Gill, and that's really about the test that's in the bill at the moment um, for remitting cases from the Sheriff Court to the Court of Session. Um, the bill proposes changes in that and makes it a bit more strict than um, currently um, happens. And Lord Gill was concerned by that, and he has since written to the committee. This is about section 884, 885 and 886 in the bill. He's since written to the committee and said that my conclusion is that the test of exceptional circumstances in section 88.4 is too high. In my opinion, the test should be the same as that set out in section 88.2. A single test for all remits is desirable in principle and has obvious <coughs> practical advantages. On section 88.5... He's concerned about um, the test of special cause, cause shown being too high, and he thinks that the test of cause shown would be adequate to meet the situation. Would you like to respond to those comments? Um, we have, of course, only just seen the letter ourselves, so uh, we need some time to look at it in uh, more detail uh, um, and consider the specific issues that he's raising. Um, the ability to remit cases is, of course an absolutely necessary and important tool and has always existed in our, in our system uh, for very good reasons. Um, but we do have to be careful that it doesn't get abused and uh, therefore there do have to be some rules in and around it so that you're not ending up with just anything and everything being remitted. Uh, so, uh, Can I say, Minister, we're happy if you've just had this to hear from you if you want to give a more specific response to us in writing. We will do that. Thank we you. will. Yeah. We will absolutely do that. But I just kind of want to yes, remind no, people certainly. that 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 remitting cases is something that is routine in the sense that it is part and parcel of the current system that we operate, and we expect that it will continue to be the case, uh, including uh, uh, when the new personal injury court comes in. There will still be. Uh, occasions, as uh, Sheriff Taylor indicated, I think that you know cases would still continue to be remitted, and I I, uh, I think that that uh, everybody would expect that. All we want to do is to ensure that, particularly over the next few years, 
that we don't have people just default almost to the current system by the use of the remit rule. We want to do. We want to make sure that that the reforms that we bring in um, are applied and do work. Um, but we need time to have a look at some of the very specific issues that are raised by Lord Gill, and we will follow up hopefully within the week. I don't, I'm looking at the officials. Is that too too fast? No. That looks like that's so we can do that within the week. Off for you. You've got to reply within a week. <laughs> yes. I, that, that would, of course, be, be very helpful, and I don't think any of us doubt the need to have some sort of test, but it's just that perhaps the bar is too high. And, and particularly Section 88.6 concerns me, where um, you seem to allow um, the consideration of the business and operational needs of the court um, to somehow come in to, and to play in that question. I understand the comments that, that were around that. Um, I, I think that is something that we, we need to take care to look at. And I mean, obviously, given Lord Gill's comments, we will be looking at some of those issues very carefully. Right. Okay. That, that would be most helpful. Thank you very much. Perhaps could turn to the, um, the most significant um, part of the bill that's caused, well, the, the part of the bill that's caused the most um, concern and the most discussion at the committee, and that's the privative limit of 150,000. Um, pounds, and you, you will know um, from, from the evidence that we've received that that has caused um, a lot of concern, um, and, and we've heard that this risks driving those who can take action uh, down to the English courts. Do you, do you accept that concern? Um, I, I'm not sure I do, because actually there is evidence that um, you know, people are already using the English courts because of the uh, inability of the Court of Session to function efficiently and, and, uh, uh, and quickly as it is. Now, what, you know, what our reforms will do is to ensure that the Court of Session, and those cases that have to go to the Court of Session for whatever reason, whether that be because they are such high-value cases or they're incredibly complex or whatever, will actually get through the Court of Session system far more expeditiously than is currently the case. And that, I think, is likely to drive up confidence in the use of the Court of Session. Uh, so those uh, um, organisations which are currently uh, uh, defaulting to the English court system uh, may review that once they see a Court of Session functioning a good deal more efficiently than it currently does. Uh, and don't forget, and you know, uh, these things are all linked, that when you have a specialist personal injury court, uh, established and running, that again is likely to increase confidence in, in the way cases are going to be dealt with. Thank you. Right, Alison, Elaine. Please, oh, thank you. you. Followed by Margaret. I think it was on the issue about private of, uh, jurisdiction, if that's the way that you pronounce it, I'm never quite sure. Um, we've also heard... You do your own voice. Yeah. You do it the way you like. <laughs> we don't mind. Um, We've heard evidence from a number of people. You may, the Minister will be aware that that's been the most contentious probably part of, of, of the bill. We've had evidence that um, the limit is now of 150,000 is, is too high. It's considerably higher than it is in Northern Ireland and in England and Wales. And there's been suggestions made that maybe it either should be lowered or it should be brought in in a staged fashion uh, to see how it works, basically, I suppose. Uh, and, uh, and it could be actually a staged increase if it, if it was felt that it was still not high enough. I wondered how, how you reacted to that suggestion. There's two issues there. Uh, one is the issue of staging the introduction. The other is the issue of the actual kind of limit. Um, and they're not the same thing, um, because don't forget, we are talking about setting up the Specialist Personal Injury Court. Now, one of the difficulties is if you start to phase in then you're, you're giving a much more faltering and slow start to that personal injury court as well. So, you know, it would have that knock-on effect of, in a sense, holding back that court from developing the expertise and the ability uh, as quickly as it otherwise could if you do the phasing in. The issue of the actual... And, and that's that side of it, which is... So I would be more resistant to the phasing in. On the issue of whether or not it should be 150,000 or, I don't know, 120 or 100, you know, we've, we've picked on 150,000 as providing the volume of cases um, uh, below which, and don't forget, this is the figure sued for. It doesn't necessarily mean that's what the settlement is. Um, uh, to, to provide the volume of cases that will create the expertise in the personal injury court. Um, there's a staggering number of these cases don't actually go to any proof at all. Yes. They settle 
at the sometimes at the door of the court. Indeed, I've been in that position myself. So it's actually quite rare for them to get to the point when you're in court actually having the argument. So, uh, uh, and they settle for figures often considerably less than are being sued for. So the 150,000 uh, limit is, is in terms of what's sued for, not in terms of you know, looking at the percentage of cases that are, uh, you know, have a settlement figure attached to them. Um, uh, and we've chosen that as looking like the most sensible in terms of volume and complexity. Um, if you're asking me, would, that, would I die in a ditch for 150,000? Well, I'm listening to everybody, having conversations with people, um, and we will continue to look at that through the uh, uh, process of the, this bill, and I would be interested in the committee's final views at stage one as well, uh, in terms of where they think it could better be uh, fixed. And we will, we will look at all of that, and I'm keeping as open a mind as I can on, on that limit. Um, have a less open mind on staging it. Thanks, thanks, Minister. One of the other, uh, you, you mentioned uh, in your opening statement, your membership of the Faculty of Advocates. One of the, the concerns which was expressed to us was that if you took that amount of casework out of the quarter session, there could be a problem in terms of the development of Scots law through case law. What's your feeling about that? I and mean, obviously you have an experience of it yourself. So. Um, well, you know, in fairness, um, my last shots fired in anger in terms of the faculty were pre-1995, so I would be, uh, I'd be uh, cautious about expressing an opinion based on personal experience. Um, uh, but I would remind people of what I said in response earlier, which is that, that surprisingly few cases actually get to the point where you're having that debate in court. So what you're talking about is effectively behind-the-scenes negotiations uh, that are going on uh, um, and, and settlement you know, being reached before you actually get to the point of proof. And I think people need to remind themselves of that, that, that you're not talking about a system where the majority of cases actually end up uh, in a civil proof at all. Um, so if it's expertise and ability actually in a courtroom, well, the majority of cases are not providing that at present, um, and I think people need to keep that on board. Um, I think I'm probably right in saying that the Faculty of Advocates is about twice the size it was when I kind of joined. Um, uh, uh, it, has, it has grown almost, if you like, in response to you know, the pressures that are within the system at the moment, and, uh, uh, and uh, um, you know, it would be, I guess, a difficult kind of study to work out whether or not it has grown to the numbers it has grown to because of what is happening in terms of the, the cases that are currently in the court of session. Uh, there is nothing to stop. And, and I mean, the, the interesting thing in the evidence last week was Sheriff, again, Sheriff Taylor, I think, saying that he would expect the same number of cases to be remitted. There will still be work for advocates. There will still be work for advocates. And I would be surprised if you didn't see advocates in the personal injury court on a regular basis. So, you know, I, I don't think we're talking about pushing the faculty off a cliff, which sometimes is the way the rhetoric sounds uh, as if it's coming uh, across. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, and I'm being reminded uh, by officials um, uh, about... Uh, um, when divorce cases kind of came out of the court of session and people will have forgotten probably because it's so long ago now Hello. Hello. Uh, I go back that, far. that they all used to be in the court of session well you know the faculty adapted yes. then um and it diversified and i think the faculty is well capable of doing the same now i think it's also mm -hmm. the case if i remind i think uh, uh, minister that Sheriff Principal said that he had never refused the sanction of council and didn't foresee that. I think that if you, if you noted that, but I think that was I also think the I case referred to the committee. That. It's, it's, yes, you know, he's, yes. He's, he's, uh, I, I guess I was concentrating more on the remitting, but, but you're right. He also said that he, he tended not to refuse the sanction, yeah. of, for, the sanction for council. And, you know, I, I think there's a, there can be a, a tendency to, to maybe slightly overstate. Uh, the, uh, the consequences of this. Having said that, um, we continue to be in dialogue uh, with the faculty and with those who've got concerns to make sure that their concerns 
are heard. And, and if we believe that there is a genuine issue at the heart of some of the concerns, then we will look very carefully at that. The uh, convener just uh, mentioned Sheriff, Bones, uh, Sheriff Taylor's uh, evidence last week, saying that uh, he could not remember ever having refused right. access to counsel. Is that, would, in your view, is that a general experience throughout Scotland? Because what I wasn't terribly sure of when he gave that evidence is uh, if he was just a particularly sympathetic Sheriff Principal and others might take a different view, or whether, in fact, that was the general position across Scotland. Well, far be it from me to say that his view would necessarily apply to every single Sheriff. I think we're all perfectly aware that Sheriffs can vary enormously, um, uh, and uh, I think that uh, solicitors are very um, uh, aware of that as well. Um, it, I, I couldn't possibly answer that question because I'm not sure that there's been any specific research done on the, uh, um, uh, um, uh, on the individual sheriffs. And that, that would be a bit invidious, of course, because yes. you would always have a spectrum. Um, uh, but I understand that the Law Society uh, gave evidence to the committee um, that uh, sanction was almost uh, never refused. So that would tend to support... Sheriff Taylor's view being much more widespread than, uh, uh, than simply confined to one or two sympathetic individuals. Don't, don't forget that sheriffs no. themselves come with an enormous background of practical experience and will be very conscious of the kinds of cases that they will personally have been involved in before where they would have known that counsel was necessary because they felt that they might have been a bit out of depth or... or, or or not able to devote the time uh, uh, and resources to it that uh, council would. So they come with their own knowledge and understanding of these processes too. They don't arrive kind of from a different system. Um, they also were helpfully said by the Sheriff Principal, he doesn't give guidance to sheriffs, he gives them indications. So I thought that was rather interesting. So <laughs> sheriffs are, you know, yes. in their own courts, have a wide degree yes. of latitude. And we know from from criminal courts that sheriffs will vary in the way they respond yes. to things and I believe you me practitioners are very well aware of that as well and they don't overplay their hand or they'll never be overplayed well, again I don't think you know <laughs> we mustn't get into memories no. of practice <laughs> um have you finished I'm fine, yes. and yep. Margaret and then I think if, I know you were a conscript but do you no, wish no, no, to no. ask <laughs> now yes <laughs> <laughs> Margaret uh, good morning minister I think you'll be very widely welcome the the comments that you've made this morning that it's not set in stone that you will listen to any arguments about the 150,000 ceiling and I wondered particularly if you would take on board some of the concerns about the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act um, 2013 section 69 which removes the automatic assumption that the uh, a breach of health and safety law is a breach of duty of care of an employer and you know whether that is likely to have uh, an effect on more cases coming forward together with the fact that if council is sanctioned then as I understand it from the bill that would only be pre-trial as opposed to having the benefit of council at hearing stage and would that have potentially an impact on the willingness of people to to settle before a trial because they feel they've looked at this inside out, they've had the benefit of counsel and they're quite content therefore to settle before going to trial and all of this impact on the business in, in the Sheriff Court. Yeah. That was a long, long question. <laughs> yeah. It was um, two strands. I'll try was it and, really? I'll, Good. I'll try and cover um, uh, all the different aspects and I'm sure if I miss any out that um, Margaret Mitchell will <laughs> come back on it. Um, the, the Cabinet Secretary has actually had um, recent discussions with the STEC uh, and others about the removal uh, by Section 69 of the strict liability um, uh, um, uh, pr uh, provision. Um, and, you know, we have considerable sympathy with their concerns. I, I don't think there's any doubt. Um, uh, we are going to continue... Uh, discussions to consider whether there's anything that we can do to help mitigate the effects of this, but obviously we'll need to explore that quite carefully. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, we you know, also make our views heard where they have to be heard, uh, and I would gently remind the member that this is a reserved matter um, and is not something uh, over which we have direct control um, yet. 
uh, and uh, uh, you know, so we have to we, we have to operate within the the rules as they are going to be laid down by this change. Um, uh, it doesn't impact on the common law um, uh, issue. The, I had an interesting, um, if somewhat technical, discussion with some of the legal officials yesterday because I, I guess the almost like the common law equivalent is what's called res, res ipsa loquitur. Now, the lawyers here will know what I mean. Yeah. Um, it, it, it basically means the thing speaks for itself. It's so obvious that you, you, you know... Bring that. We're <laughs> ready to come in. <laughs> Was so, that the bag of sugar falling on somebody's head yeah, or something, something like, like that? that yes. As I recall. But the, thing, remember, the, point, yes. the point about it is that albeit this removes the statutory strict liability, it doesn't remove the capacity to still plead a, a civil case on the basis of, of res ipsa. Now, you know, that is an interesting and technical argument, and I wouldn't like to guess how many res ipsa cases um, uh, the courts currently hear, uh, um, and that would probably be in a debate prior to proof, assuming that's still the procedure we, we, uh, uh, we adopt, as I look kind of vainly around to check that my, my, my re remembrance of uh, practice isn't uh, uh, out of date. So um, uh, I think it just, we just need to caution that it, doesn't, it can't remove the common law equivalent. Res ipsa is a kind of strict liability, but it's not couched in, in, in statutory terms. I don't want to overstate it, um, uh, uh, because this is still an issue, uh, and it is still an issue that we will continue to explore the impact of and consider whether or not we can mitigate. And I will take on board the aspect of the question that the member had about some of the uh, pre-proof uh, involvement of, of, of council in respect of this uh, and what impact there might be, uh, there, might be there. Um, uh, Again, I need to go back to the fact that most things don't go to proof, and that will include these as well. Uh, you know, you, you end up with a kind of settled uh, uh, action, um, and uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to uh, to glean from the settlement uh, what, in legal terms, was the telling points. Very straightforward, quite a less lengthy question. <laughs> uh, summary, sheriffs, we were no doubt from Lord Gill's um, evidence last year, absolutely key to the, the reform. Um, I understand the Scottish Government was looking at a one in, one out, a sheriff retires and a summary sheriff is appointed. Could the, com the uh, Minister confirm if that is the case and how this will, will impact? Hey, uh, I think maybe the one in, one out is a slightly misleading uh, thing and I wouldn't want people to think that we were just automatically going to you know, retire a, a sheriff and, and automatically appoint a summary sheriff because it will have to be looked on uh, on a case-by-case -case basis as we go through. We, we would anticipate it taking... Now, uh, officials might remind me uh, um, uh, if I'm wrong, about 10 years to sort of to make the the crossover. So the one in one out isn't a uh, isn't a kind of rule in terms of uh, uh, retire a, 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 a sheriff, appoint a summary sheriff, because there will be cases when that is simply not the appropriate thing to do. Uh, and I wouldn't want the one in one out to make it sound as if that's what's going to happen, because it's not. Um, and it will also be a matter for the. Scottish Court Service because that's they're the recruitment body uh, and they will have to look in each case at what the situation is in the in the in the sheriffdom that that they're they're looking at there will be some sheriffdoms where appointing summary sheriffs will be a more obvious and uh, uh, and better way to go there will be other sheriffdoms where that may not happen to be the case in the early years um, and just to add to that the forced stipendiary magistrates in Glasgow will become summary sheriffs. So it, it, it's, it's it, the one in, one out is maybe a shorthand term that has been used, understandably, but I wouldn't want it to mislead people into thinking that it was the way the member had had perhaps interpreted it as being. So summary sheriffs will be appointed, you know, per se? When appropriate, conference. yes. Just when appropriate? Well, no, but, but when vacancies arise, we yeah. will then be looking at whether or not a, a, a summary sheriff is what's appropriate or a sheriff is what's appropriate. It won't automatically be that when a vacancy arises, it will automatically be a summary sheriff. Okay? Now, obviously, we're trying to move over so that we've got uh, uh, 
a, a real pool of summary sheriffs in place. Uh, and, and, you know, many of the vacancies will result in replacement by summary sheriffs. But it won't be an automatic sheriff out, summary sheriff in. So is there any indication of, of when you might reach a full complement of summary sheriffs, given that these are so very key to the reforms? Well, I think I used a 10-year timeline, about a decade. So right. we're not, you know, you, you, you can't snap your fingers in any part of the legal system and have it effected overnight. Um, so uh, people will have time to get used to it, time to get used to the system, um, uh, and at no point will there be a kind of rupture uh, um, uh, at all. And, and uh, uh, I think we've got about six retirals a year, um, around six retirals a year. So you're not talking about, you know, a huge sudden influx. We are giving this time to bed in. So the phased, phased question that Elaine Murray asked about the privative limit, in a sense, uh, is genuinely what's happening here. And the court reforms too, because I think um, they'd said in, in practical terms, the, um, the representative from the Scottish courts, they looked at the 10-year time frame too. So do you have any concerns about all of the 150,000 kind of primitive level of cases coming in a one uh, when the reforms themselves are going to take 10 years to the reform of the IT system, various things that he mentioned would have to be done to accommodate this? Uh, no, because the, I don't I mean the, the, the change in the privative limit is, is, is shifting a workload, but the introduction of summary sheriffs is also about rationalising workload too. Um, uh, uh, I, I don't think, I can't see that there would be any issue there uh, uh, at all. Um, of, you know, I, the estate and, can, and all I, of these sort yeah, of things. I, I, I need to remind the member about the Specialist Personal Injury Court, about which there hasn't been very much discussion, but, but we are talking yes, about... Yes, somebody's no, poised, probably. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure. But the thing is that uh, uh, the Specialist Injury Court will, will, you know, will also be sitting. They will be absorbing uh, a, 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 a pretty big percentage of the caseload that transfers over. Um, and, you know, it will be for individuals to choose whether they want to do their personal injury case at a local court or consider the specialist injury court in Edinburgh. And I, I'm having a discussion about this um, earlier, um, and there is a kind of sense in which uh, that when the specialist injury court is up and running, and it may very well be sitting in a court of session court, that, that with council going in and out, that in reality it will not really look heck of a different to what you, you currently have. So, you know, the whole, the, the system all fits together in that sense. So, uh, um, and the, 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 the introduction of summary sheriffs uh, will remove from sheriffs uh, some of the things that they get caught up. You know, at the moment you might have a very, very good personal injury sheriff who could be spending half a day in a motions court listening to, you know, a, a stream of things coming in and out in, in, a, in a sheriff court when his expertise might be better placed somewhere else. Just the last aspect of the summary sheriffs, I think Lord Gill had very much welcomed them as had others for um, bringing consistency and a level of experience um, throughout the, the judiciary. And one of the recommendations was that part-time sheriffs would uh, be eliminated or at least cut down, yet the bill um, removes the cap on them. Can the Minister comment on, on that? Well, I think the, uh, the continued availability of potential for part-time sheriffs is necessary given you know, the geography of Scotland and, and all the rest of it. We, we do, there is an urban-rural issue which I know that some members of the committee have concerns about. So in some cases, you know, the provision of part-time sheriffs would, uh, uh, would alleviate problems that might arise in, in such areas. Um, I don't think the cap that's being removed, we just, it's just an artificial cap. I don't think the intention is to have loads and loads of part-time sheriffs. We've moved away from that uh, in, in more recent years. But I think it's just to retain the capacity to do it 
um, uh, um, where necessary, when necessary. Um, uh, so there will still continue to be part-time sheriffs. And there may continue, I, mean, I, I think I'm right in saying part-time summary yes. sheriffs as well. Yes. Uh, um, because we have to make sure uh, that, that resources fit the need um, and that we don't have full-time sheriffs sitting in places where there simply isn't the work for them. And you don't have any, um, any concerns about consistency? with part-time sheriffs or summary sheriffs for that matter? Well, no, because in fact some of the summary sheriffs will themselves be quite specialist. I mean, I think the idea for summary sheriffs is to, is to re, you know, is, is hopefully to be recruiting from some areas of specialisms um, that at the moment there are criticisms about perhaps an absence in the, the Shrevo benches, you know, for example, in family law. So, so uh, it, it, it isn't... It isn't about this group are generalists and that group are specialists. Specialism can run throughout the system. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, um, so I, you know, I, 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 I think it's to try and see this whole thing fitting together as, as one. I'm also being reminded that there are also uh, um, peripatetics that will be able to be deployed nationwide too. So, you know, we've always got to keep in mind um, the, the issues in Scotland and particularly very rural areas, some of the concerns that there are expressed there, that there may only be certain numbers of cases or few cases and things. So we, we, we need to make sure um, uh, that capacity is available throughout Scotland. That's helpful. Thank you, Minister. Uh, does anyone wish... Do you wish a short break, Minister? We just plough on? You're fine. We'll <laughs> plough on. And I didn't mean anything personal about that. We've discovered it's privative. <laughs> Privative, Elaine. Take that home with you tonight. Right above my bedpost. Right above your bedpost. Roderick. Thank you, convener. Uh, first of all, could I refer to my register of interest as a practising member of the Faculty of Advocates? <laughs> um, if I might just start, I've got questions on a variety of uh, slightly different things, but uh, if I could just comment on the, the personal injury point. I think some of the concerns from personal injury practitioners is uh, a recognition of how much um, workplace health and safety law is actually coming from Scotland at the present time. So the test will be under new arrangements to try and preserve, preserve that and ensure that still the right kind of cases on those points are actually making it to the court of session when they can make law. Um, but if I can, I could just move on now to the, the commercial. Well, that was um, a question. It's a statement. Yes, it was. It was evidence. It, it was evidence. Uh, yes. If I can, just move on to uh, um, uh, the question of commercial jurisdiction. Um, a number of uh, members of uh, the bar concerned do not see why um, the same jurisdiction limit should be applied to commercial cases as to personal injury. Mm -hmm. They say that there will be no saving to the public purse or not intangible saving the public purse of, of the new jurisdiction. Um, they say commercial procedure works well in the court of session, but we heard also from Sheriff Taylor that commercial procedure, in his view, was working well in Glasgow Sheriff Court. Um, some junior members of the bar have suggested that uh, if we are to maintain that uh, distinction, then there's a case for a uh, an all Scotland commercial court. I wondered if you would like to comment on that. And then obviously the bill does provide, make provision for that to be a possibility in due course. Yeah. It's not something we're uh, uh, looking at in the immediate future, it's fair to say. On, on the question of differentiating between the personal injury cases and the commercial cases, um, I, I, I hear the concerns, uh, I understand the concerns. Um, that is one issue that we will look very carefully at um, throughout the process of the bill. And again, um, I would be interested in knowing the committee's views on that. Um, uh, I, I guess at this stage I would signal that I'm still reasonably open-minded on whether or not there should be a differential commercial limit uh, uh, as opposed to the, to the more general 150,000. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't want to get too drawn into no, what okay, that I'll might be, but, yeah. but uh, um, I, I do understand uh, and take on board the comments that have been made. Yeah. Uh, around that. Um, if I could just move on to the, the contentious area of automatic sanction for counsel. Um, Axiom advocates in their submission said if the purpose of restricting the freedom of litigants is to, choose, is to control costs, it would be better to have measures aimed directly at the issue rather than the blunt instrument of dictating what forum may be used. Would you like to comment on that? Well, in a sense, the ability to remit from one forum to another um, the capacity for sanction to be granted where it's considered appropriate, um, you know, are both things which 
contradict the dictatorial element of, uh, or the apparent dictatorial element of this. We are trying to shift uh, a substantial amount of business, but we are cognizant of the fact that we cannot uh, um, legislate for every single case. Uh, and therefore, it's important that we ensure that when cases are incredibly complex, regardless of the amount of money that is being sued for, uh, that there is the capacity for that to be uh, uh, sent back or sent to the Court of Session. Um, uh, so I'm not entirely sure I would accept the characterisation uh, um, as, as it's being expressed. I'm sure it was a paraphrase of somebody else's characterisation. Um, uh, um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the notion that we could deal with costs, I, I, I rather imagine had we, had we done it the other way by, by beginning to interfere in what could and could not be feed and, and, and all the rest of it, there would be every bit as many objections to that. Um, uh, because in a sense, that is a more obvious kind of restraint of trade, isn't it? Uh, if you start imposing that kind of rule on what people can charge. Because that's the other side of the coin, you know, which is uh, not, what we're, not what we've chosen to do. Um, uh, um, I mean, our argument would be that very low value cases probably don't really require uh, counsel. Um, certainly experienced solicitors are doing these, you know, week in, week out already um, and can continue to do so, in my view, uh, uh, without there being any detriment. Um, uh, and again, I just go back to the fact of the existence of the personal injury uh, court. Um, so uh, the, the, that rather blunt characterisation of what we're doing, I think, is to ignore... Um, some of the actual detail around what we're doing. Are you able to uh, give us any further update as to when uh, the government will be issuing its response to Sheriff Taylor's report? Oh, that's a good question. Late, uh, late spring. <laughs> <laughs> Imminent. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I won't ask you the next question. When does spring become summer? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, yeah. No, obviously, uh, I mean, this, this spring. Yeah, well, I didn't know which spring we were talking about, yes, uh, I'm Obviously, some some uh, submissions have suggested that there is a kind of some correlation here, and it would be sensible if we uh, had a better idea of how the two things were going to kind of embark uh, before reaching a kind of a final view on this bill. It's pretty much in the hands of the officials, um, right. and uh, um, I, I don't know whether or not um, our response will be available before the stage one debate. Uh, I would certainly hope, so, certainly before stage two, anyway. Since that, yeah. which is late June, I'm being told, yes. which yes. is summer. summer yes. And I think late <laughs> June is <laughs> not spring anymore. <laughs> the fledglings will have fledged yeah, by then. I have a couple, a couple of more uh, more points. One is on ADR. I detect from the submissions of Scottish Arbitration Centre and indeed Citizens Advice Scotland uh, concerns that whilst uh, the bill provides that courts may uh, in the rules of court make reference to ADR, that not enough is being done to try and promote it. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I mean, as a government, obviously, we've been very much in favour of the promotion of ADR. In fact, the Scottish Arbitration Centre, you know, wouldn't have come about had it not been for uh, the very good work of Jim Mather when he was a minister. Um, and it is partly funded uh, by us as well. And through... Um, uh, through all of the work that government does, we look for opportunities to embed uh, the use of arbitration uh, into, uh, into what we do, and that will continue. Personally, I have always been uh, uh, very much a proponent, a proponent of the use of all forms of alternative dispute resolution. The difficulty is, of course, as people will know, that some aspects of alternative dispute resolution cannot be mandated. You, you can't force people into mediation because, by definition, it simply won't work in those circumstances. Uh, and even uh, um, uh, uh, arbitration is a, a more formal uh, uh, kind of process, um, uh, and people have to agree at the start to accept the outcome, the, 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 the binding outcome from an arbitration. Um, so the point about alternative dispute resolution is that you can't simply 
uh, um, make it mandatory for people uh, to do it. What we would hope is um, that everybody involved in the legal system understands uh, uh, the importance of it. I know that there are certain areas of the law where that is already something that is recognised, and particularly family law practitioners are very good at, at, uh, at trying to ensure that as much as possible is done in this way. But, you know, it won't be practical or possible in, in all uh, cases. Um, so from a government perspective, we do try to do as much as we can. Um, you know, th there is a point beyond which, I, I guess, any government has to be careful not to start to interfere with the mechanisms of the court and, you know, the way the court rules are drawn up. It's not really our place and uh, it will continue to be um, uh, something that I think, again, going back to an earlier discussion, may vary from sheriff to sheriff the extent to which they will encourage or give credence to uh, prior attempts at um, mediation or alternative um, uh, um, rules. Um, I think the bill does uh, uh, overtly recognise that it should be encouraged in the court rules. Um, uh, but, you know, we're, we, you know, we, we, we ha there's only so far we can go uh, in, 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 in terms of court rules. Um, and uh, I, I think myself, that some of it is a generational change. I think some of it's generational. If I could perhaps move on to the question of the Sheriff Appeal Court and to uh, um, the anticipation that 5% uh, of total civil appeals will, uh, um, would uh, require three appeal sheriffs. Um, and I think this, this, this suggestion is that a bigger bench would be a more appropriate where there are novel and complex issues. Um, I think Lord Gill made the point that it's open to uh, parties to seek a, 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 um, a bench beyond one. But I, I wondered, obviously, is a significant financial cost um, of having 5% as opposed to 100% um, of cases with three appeal sheriffs, where the, the government got its 5% figure from and how robust that is? Well, the vast majority, and I think the Lord President actually indicated this, the vast majority uh, of appeals are minor and procedural. So uh, a, the figure will have come from the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the information that we have on, on that basis. Um, the, the, the quorum of the court is basically going to be left to court rules. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm being surrounded by post it notes here, <laughs> which, which can sometimes um, disjoint. Uh, right, I'm being told the figure actually came from work that the Scottish Court Service did, so one has to assume that the information that Lord Gill has about the minor and procedural things is work that the Scottish Court Service will have probably uh, looked at themselves. Um, the, the quorum uh, is to be left to court rules, and we've not constrained uh, that. Um, uh, sheriffs, principal and experienced sheriffs will be uh, potentially appeal sheriffs. Um, uh, having the bench of one replicates the current system with the sheriff principal hearing the appeals. So at present, the appeal is to the sheriff principal in, uh, in, in these cases. Uh, so in a sense, what we're doing is replicating the current system. So uh, we believe it's... Um, uh, uh, we believe it's proportionate um, uh, and it provides a lot of the benefits of the current system. Um, uh, I think uh, the Lord President last week gave a, an indication that parties could seek a bigger bench. Yes. I, I'm, I hesitate to disagree with the Lord President, but I'm not sure he's correct in his interpretation of the bill, so we will just double check that for the committee because that's, that would be a kind of conflict of, of evidence that might be arising on a completely mistaken understanding of something. So we'll, we'll just give you... Wrong. Well, I, I, that's why, I, Perhaps I, that's why I said I hesitate to yes. <laughs> disagree with the Lord President. Um, uh, uh, but it, uh, it, it, it's possible he's misinterpreted something in the, in the bill.
But it's true that the bill, at least in that respect, differs from the Gill review on this point. So it's something that probably as a committee we want to look carefully at. Um, I, I, I can understand why the committee would. Um, uh, uh, on the upside, it's evidence that we're not simply enacting everything that you know the Lord President has said. We have actually looked at these issues on a case-by-case -case basis. And you know what, what we've provided for in the bill, in our view, pretty much replicates the system as it currently is. As I said, you know, appeals in the Sheriff Court go to a single sheriff, the Sheriff Principal. Um, and uh, um, that's one sitting on his own. So. Okay, I'll let other members... I, I, I think, I don't know if you asked this, Roddy, because I was a bit distracted, but I think the bill... I don't know, did you ask for Section 49? And the fact that a sheriff, mm -hmm. Lord President, could just have a sheriff sitting yes. in appellate yes. capacity. You asked about that, yeah. did you? Yeah. You didn't. I think, the, I think there were issues about that, I think, for the committee generally, because um, the Section 47 says... And just imagine we've got a sheriff sitting on their own, listening to appeal... A decision of the Sheriff of Appeal Court, this is just a sheriff perhaps sitting, is binding in proceedings before a sheriff anywhere in Scotland. So, you know, I think, and Lord Gill reflected on this when he was questioned on it, that his personal view is it should be a sheriff principal sitting alone, not a sheriff, well, when it's, it's single. A, it's a new office, a new, a new role of appeal sheriff. It's not, a, it, 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 it's not just, you know, drafting in Sheriff Joe blogs and, 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 and out again. You know, we will be designating an office uh, of appeal sheriff. Um, and I think that people need to remember that even in the present setup, sheriffs uh, will act up as temporary sheriff principals, and when they do that, they will do appeals already. Give me, Minister, they're only binding on their own sheriffdom then. And, and the issue here is, I think, if we had somebody of the rank of sheriff deciding an appeal sitting alone, which is binding across the whole of Scotland, there may be unintended consequences of that, to put it no uh, more uh, seriously than that. And certainly Lord Gill's view, because he was challenged on this, at column 4534 of the evidence last week, when asked, may I suggest by myself that if we can't have the position of three sheriff principals sitting, we should at least have one sheriff principal sitting and not a sheriff, even if it's a procedural matter, to which he replied, that would be my personal view. Yeah, and that but, was I mean, quite I firm. I need to remind you, know, we are talking about a new office of appeal sheriff. We're not, you know, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is a new designation. Uh, um, uh, and I, I just need to kind of remind people of that. Uh, you know, applying, applying the, the, um, the, the precedent across the whole of Scotland, uh, you know, I, I personally don't think is a bad thing. I, I don't know that Lord Gill was as exercised about it as you're perhaps suggesting, um, but uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it, it, it leads to a greater certainty and you know I'm conscious that members in different debates and different aspects of what we do are always very concerned about postcode lotteries well the same thing can apply here if we're not careful uh, and therefore I think it would be uh, it useful to have uh, uh, um, the ability for these to apply across Scotland you know we're, we're only talking about experienced sheriffs doing this job we're not talking uh, uh, you know, we're not talking about somebody coming in the door as a brand new sheriff of six months being being uh, appointed to this Forgive office of appeal Forgive me, sheriff. you know, I, I, I mean, obviously we don't think that. Yeah. But I think the concern is, and there's, I don't think there's an issue about the decisions of the appellate court and the sheriffdom applying, uh, the, the sheriff appeal court applying across Scotland. I don't, for me, there's not an issue about that. But there is an issue about a sheriff sitting in, in an appellate uh, position making a decision throughout the Scotland, then reverting to being a sheriff again, going back the next day into a sheriff job. So there are issues here about the, the, well, the, 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 the not the validity of the appeal, but the clout, uh, the substance of could, that appeal standing. You could equally apply that argument to those sheriffs who occasionally sit as temporary court session judges and who, who, uh, who make decisions in... in, in, in in cases, and then uh, and then go back to sitting in their yeah, sheriff court. Appealed, it's, we're at appellate level. Mm. That's the issue. It's not at the first instance level. Anyway, I leave it at that. That's yeah. a concern I think that was put by Lord Gillan 
if I may see by a few nodding heads, may have been shared by members of the committee. It's just an issue to, to highlight to the, to the minister. Assist the committee. Um, the chair of appeal court can decide if it's an issue that it thinks com is complex. It can convene a larger bench. Um, to provide more sheriffs on, on the yeah. Sheriff Appeal Court? I think it's just the fact that the principle of appeals should be heard by a sheriff principal, not a sheriff, even if they're the most wonderfully experienced sheriff in the entire planet, you know, that they would be dealing with um, appeals from um, other sheriffs of the same rank. And it is the appellate level and not at first instance as in the court of session. But I'll leave it at that. It's an issue that has been raised and you hadn't raised it, Roddy, so I thought I'd raise it. Sandra, is that all right? You don't mind? Sandra to follow by Christian and then John Pentland, please. Uh, thank you very much. Give you a good morning, uh, Minister. I wanted to touch on the personal injury court, uh, but I also wanted to comment on something that Lord Gill had said that in your opening remarks you said that... The, this has to be changed, it has to be reviewed. In fact, Lord Gill's uh, comments at the end of the session were it was 50 years out of date, uh, basically. So I think we're dealing with something that has to be you know, looked at in the round, and not just uh, individual ones. In the personal injury court, there's been a number of issues that were raised. Uh, one of the issues was that uh, would the personal injury court uh, be better or give a comparable service to the court of session? And if it you know, adequate resources have been put forward for the personal injury court. Do you have any comments on that one? Um, I think traditionally the, the legal system in Scotland has um, resisted specialisation. That, that was a, 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 a you know, traditional view uh, of both solicitor and advocate is that they, they should be uh, capable of um, taking up almost any case. Now, in practice, of course, that has never really been the case um, and people would have been long aware that there were both practitioners and sheriffs who were much more capable in some areas than they might have been in others, much more comfortable in some areas than they might have been in others and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the reluctance in the past to embrace specialisation um, uh, is going to change now because the, we have a new Lord President who has a very different view of, of, of things, uh, which is uh, why we can look at the setting up of a personal injury court. Now, I just want to remind people of something I said earlier, that the personal injury court, the specialist personal injury court, is, is not meaning that every single personal injury case in Scotland has to come to this personal injury court. People will still be able to choose to do their action in their own local court if, if they so desire. Um, or alternatively come to the, 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 the court in, in Edinburgh. Um, I think what will develop in the court in Edinburgh is you know, a specialisation centred around much more complex cases and that you may, you know, if we could have a time machine that would take us forward 20 or 30 years, find that we had a system where you know, the, the, the simple, straightforward cases continue to be done locally and the much more complex cases... Uh, were, uh, uh, were heard uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, and I think that the, the changed view uh, uh, in the Lord President's office will begin to filter down and have an impact on, uh, uh, on all practitioners. Um, uh, it is the case that uh, not all specialist courts have been as successful as others. Um, uh, if you never try something, you never know. Um, uh, but I have every confidence that the Specialist Injury Court will be successful. Um, uh, and um, uh, we, you know, so we're, we're uh, uh, so we look forward to that. But again, going back to the fact that we do think it'll take a number of years to build up. It isn't, you know, it would just not, it's not all going to happen absolutely overnight. Um, uh, but two sheriffs have already been identified for the new court, so we're already, you know, underway with ensuring that uh, it will be ready to go as soon as uh, as the whistle is blown for them. Um, uh, but certainly, early days, I, I, you know, there won't be hundreds and hundreds of cases all at once in the specialist court. I think the figure I'm being given is somewhere between uh, uh, 
25 to 30 in the mm -hmm. in the kind of in the first year but that's going to proof and, and I go back to what I said right at the start that actually a huge number don't go to proof but 25 to 30 proofs in in the sheriff court in the first year given the way the court sit is probably going to be roughly one a week um, yeah, mm -hmm. you know it's 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 difficult to kind of think, and, and they won't come just as easily as that. But mm -hmm. you know, but th that is that is um, eminently schedulable, if that's if that's the way to say it. Check with me. <laughs> She's good at words. <laughs> schedulable is that word? Schedulable. Yeah, I think so. The point. The point. It's corroborated. It's corroborated. In terms of managing, oh. in terms of managing the business, that is that 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 works. Yes. Uh, thank you. Talk about corroboration. We don't want to bring that one in again. Says, oh. says, says the convener, but uses it quite yeah, quite often. I, I, I take on board what the minister said. It's not going to be a huge influx, obviously, and complicated cases as well. And that was one of the issues that I wanted to raise. Also, I'm pleased you mentioned the fact that you've been in talks with us. Do you see in regards to you know injuries that uh, sustained at work? Uh, we also heard evidence from the Clydeside Action Asbestos. Uh, situation uh, where when asked they said they would prefer the court of session but however the per criminal injury court the personal injury court if it was able to suffice that to uh, be heard at the highest level and also they were able to get advocate there uh, they would go for the personal injury court now, what would you would you have meetings with Clydeside action or would you look at them as perhaps being a special case because it's complicated he has already had meetings with cloud side action mm. and i do we do understand that the nature of the complexity in these yeah. cases is such that uh, uh um personally and i i think the cabinet secretary shares these views that they will probably continue to end up in the court of session for reasons of complexity um uh, and uh, uh i i i i'd be i'd be wary of uh, um, drawing an artificial line around a particular category of cases. I, I'm not particularly keen on going down that road, but I think the complexity of those cases is precisely the kind of thing that the court of session probably should be uh, um, the, the, the forum. Certainly just now, you know, who knows 10 years down the line, people may feel uh, that even cases as complex as that can be heard in the new personal injury court. But my guess is in the early years, they will still continue to be heard in the court of session. I'm not seeing any horrified looks on the faces of <laughs> officials, so my guess is that's pretty much what they that's think as well. Them. Thank you. Thank you, Kavina. I don't think we had horrified mm. looks either, actually, so if we may be part of this happy uh, day. Uh, Christian, followed by John Pentland, please. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, I'm going to have a question following... Um, Principal Judge Taylor told us that uh, especially the chief courts uh, were at the heart of the court reform, but there is a cost attached to these court reforms. And uh, we heard from the Scottish Court Service who told us that we could take uh, from the existing funding, you know, that we could take on the cost of these court reforms. We heard as well that uh, there will be a re-evaluation of fees, of court fees, thereafter. I just wonder if the minister would like to comment and maybe reassure the committee that uh, the changing on court fees will not be funding part of the funding for the uh, court reform changes. Well, decisions about court fees are not mine to make. They're the Scottish Court Service um, will be looking at uh, uh, any consideration of fee structures would be for them. Um, yeah, just you want just to, to clarify, um, fees of solicitors, advocates, etc., in the courts as a matter for the Scottish well for the courts to, to determine fees of actually raising an action in the court to uh, ministers retain that power. Oh, right, so it's two slightly different issues. Well, we, weren't, we know that. We were, I think we're talking about outlays, the payment of fees in to, to put documents in. Is that your point you're making, Chris? Yes. The actual kind of, oh, right. Procedural suppose, fees. Procedural that fees. That, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, court that fees the rather than solicitors and that's, advocates. That's the Scottish fees. Court Service decision making process. Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm taking from the member what he's concerned about is that we may suddenly see an artificial rise in some of these fees as a way of, well, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the Scottish Court Service. 
Uh, but I, I think they would be well aware that people would be watching that rather carefully. <laughs> uh, and uh, I doubt that their intentions are uh, to suddenly whack up fees uh, in any part of the... Um, uh, of the thing, uh, um, I mean, it's certainly not ministers' decisions, uh, decision uh, or intention to raise fees for uh, uh, for lodging actions in the first place, uh, for raising actions in the first place. That we, we wouldn't be intending to do that, I don't think. Uh, again, not seeing anybody worried. I mean, it, it's something that you would it, it would be done on a routine basis in any case. I mean, you would always have on a rolling basis people looking at whether or not. Any any uh, costs were appropriate to what you know what what it actually resulted in, and they've gone up undoubtedly in in the past for that reason. And you would continue uh, to do that because you're not going to artificially hold them at a low level. But but in the sense that your concerns are that they will suddenly artificially be raised in order to pay for something. No, we wouldn't. We would not want that to be happening. Uh, uh, um, uh, either um, and uh, uh, just to reassure people it is a there is a kind of three year process for this um, and uh, the, so 2015 will be um, when there is a consultation on the next consideration um, uh, and orders are laid in Parliament for scrutiny. So if the committee did have any concerns, it could keep its eye out for those orders coming through uh, after next year's consultation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John Pentland, followed by John Finney. Thank and you, um, I hope this will be, I think this will be the last two, if I say this, I'll get people putting their hands up. We'll make these the last two questions, if that's all right, with the committee. Right, John Pentland, John Finney, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Minister, I wonder if you would wish to comment for the record eh, on the apparent conflict in the Scottish Government's argument that removing 2,700 cases from the Court of Session will significantly increase its efficiency, whilst it also argues that a large number of those 2,700 cases do not involve substantial work for the Court, namely that 98 per cent of personal injured cases are settled without a hearing. They're settled without a proof. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that there haven't been, you know, cases calling and proceedings uh, um, throughout uh, uh, the, the conduct of the case. Now, these these aren't necessarily um, uh, uh, long or particularly complicated, uh, uh, but they do uh, and are part of the problem of clogging up the courts because you have uh, court session judges sitting, listen to motions of of, you know, adjournments and motions of, you know, this, that and the other, uh, which uh, are, you know, part and parcel of the process, but they're not going to a final proof. So I, I don't want to get into the involved complexities of uh, taking a civil court case through uh, the process, but uh, take it from me uh, that the proof, if you get there, is the, is the final part of it or the settlement at that point. But there will have been uh, a, a number of occasions leading up to that when uh, the case will have called in the court um, and everybody, and that will include advocates, have got to be there. But it may only be for something that lasts five or ten minutes um, uh, and, 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 then, uh, and then they'll come back. Um, uh, uh, um, and, you know, uh, when we talk about the vast majority of cases settling prior to proof. That doesn't mean to say that proof dates haven't been fixed. Proof dates get fixed, get put in the court's diary, and not invariably, you know, the proof date is met, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning by um, the pursuer uh, and the defender's uh, advocate standing in front of the judge saying, well, actually, we've had a long, long discussion and we've decided that we are, we've agreed on a settlement and we've agreed on this and we've agreed on that. So the, the proof dates that have been put into the Court of Sessions diary that have displaced a whole load of other business because they've got to be held then collapse at 10 o'clock in the morning. So you've then got days that were meant to be, de and judges that were meant to be designated to do proofs, but all in the knowledge that that is the more likely outcome, but nevertheless, you do still have to do the scheduling. So, you know, it's, it's, 
it, it isn't just as simple as there isn't things happening. Lots of things have been happening. Scheduling of these things, including the proofs, has to happen. And that's all disruptive and all increases the inefficiency of, uh, of, of the court of session. Now, you're probably never going to get a position where the majority of personal injury cases do go to proof. Whatever court they're in, most of them settle. Most of them settle. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of the expertise is not in court expertise, it's um, back door, back room expertise. Um, uh, um, but the, the estimated number of cases that we're going to transfer is about half of all cases heard in the court of session. And you can, and given what I've just said in terms of the way business has to be scheduled, you can see what a huge difference it will make to the court of session if, if that is lifted away from them, uh, their other business will be able to proceed far more expeditiously. I was in question. danger of giving evidence myself, having instructed <laughs> counsel in PI cases. And Always a problem when there are lawyers on a justice Because, as we, as we know around this table, that they will set three or four proofs for, for beginning in a week for four days on the basis pr that they presume two or three will settle. So it is a, a very complex... I don't want to sit over there for a wee while just to give evidence, but mustn't do it. John? We maybe arrange that for next week, then. You'll yeah, arrange it for next week, John. You can take the chair. Right, off you uh, go. Again, Minister, in earlier evidence, uh, we heard from the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers described that the existing system has been in crisis. Uh, having heard that, does the Minister think it's possible for the reforms to be implemented, including this 2,700 additional cases entering the system uh, without any additional resources? Um, well, yes, because you're shifting from one part of the system to another. You're not, you're not you know, changing... Uh, um, uh, anything. You're not increasing the number of cases overall. You're, you're shifting within the system, and that comes from within the same uh, overall set of resources. And as I indicated, that we've already got two sheriffs designated uh, as suitable for the new personal injury court. Um, and I think I gave a figure earlier of the 25 to 30 cases that would be likely to go to proof in a year in that new personal injury court and we think all of that is absolutely doable. After all, these cases are already having to go through the system as it is. So uh, um, uh, it, it, it's not that we've created a whole new set of cases or a whole new set of, uh, 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 of, of, of procedures. All we're doing is, is moving things around. And arguably, uh, given the benefits for the court of session, you know, the court of session arguably may be able to make considerable savings because it will be able to work far more efficiently than it currently is able to do. So I take it then what you're saying, Minister, is that the extra cases that are going to go to sheriff courts won't add to the, the, the existing pressure that's already there? No, because we've got, first of all, I indicated, I think, right at the start that the number of personal injury cases in the Sheriff Courts has already decreased um, uh, significantly. Um, uh, were total cases, not personal No, total cases, but you know, the capacity of the Sheriff Courts is already there. We're setting up the new specialist court, uh, um, and uh, uh, it's not the global number of cases doesn't change, that it's just where they're heard is, is changing. So we haven't, in, we haven't increased the caseload in the Scottish civil justice system at all. We're, we're moving it, and, and what we believe we're doing is making it far more efficient um, uh, than it is currently. OK. John? I feel, I feel the highlands and islands coming up. Well, Am I right? You, you are quite correct. I knew you are it. Quite correct. And it's to, to, Minister, I was reassured by some of your earlier, earlier comments um, um, about rural communities and one size not fitting all. You also, if I noted you correctly, talked about your aspiration for it to be accessible, affordable and efficient. In the policy memorandum about island communities, um, the, the proposition uh, of the Scottish Court Service is that uh, the three island courts would be sheriff and jury centres. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can read out the whole um, the paragraph, but I suspect uh, I'd be better just to quote some words from it. Words like, not expected, envisaged, seems doubtful at least in the short term. 
it's heavily caveated, um, um, but there is a statement that it would seem unlikely there's going to be a sheriff, a, a summary sheriff at any point appointed there. In the past, I've asked Mr McQueen, the, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Court Service, about greater use of technology. If we're going to retain the sheriffs um, in these three islands, and I sincerely hope we are, can we look at UK, looking at the technology for people from out with these areas to, to use the services there, retaining these people in post, which is a significant uh, morale booster, I think, for communities. We are already looking at that. I mean, there are obviously significant uh, um, issues uh, uh, that can be uh, managed by the um, good use of new technologies, like video linking, use of electronic signatures and all the rest of it, that would lift some of the what currently has to be done uh, locally, but but in practice in the future wouldn't necessarily be the case. Um, uh, uh, so that at the same time as we're, you know, hoping to retain these sheriff courts, what we don't want to do is have that sheriff sitting having to do a lot of stuff that can be dealt with by uh, better technological means. So we are looking very carefully uh, uh, at those capacities, and it is part and parcel of our whole reform package that we be doing that at the same time. Uh, and, and that will, uh, we hope, uh, uh, and you know, I, I don't have a time capsule, so I can't look forward, but that will give us the capacity to sustain these sheriff courts in these island areas, uh, which I'm sure is what everybody would want to see happening. Sustain sheriff, however, yeah. 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 Thank you very much. I know I said that was the last question, but this is on behalf of the committee. Uh, it's always it's tell a, you it's the last photograph. It's my supplementary. Uh, it's because we have a petition before us, uh, Minister, Petition 1504, uh, which uh, the requirement that two advocates must certify an appeal to the Supreme Court. And I, I would ask you where you consider which uh, the proposals in the bill to require permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, which I think is the position in England, if I recall. You have to have permission from the highest court of, in England to go to the Supreme Court. If that will adequately, to bring us in line, will that adequately protect the interests of particular party litigants? Now, if the Minister's not considered, it's fine if you write and answer that. I'm raising it because we have a petition before us. Um, an official has just uh, said to me that you're correct in your um, assumption about the situation in England. Um, it brings it into line. Sorry? It brings it into line. Yeah. That's a worry so, off me then. I got that right. Yes. brings okay. it into line. So um, uh, I, I, I'm kind of being advised that we probably shouldn't make too much comment um, uh, about individual cases, notwithstanding that the petition kind of arises out of an individual case. So. Do you, you want to come in on that particular yes, issue? Really but the petition, not her individual case, which yeah. I don't think would have been affected in any way, but just whether this makes it harder for party litigants. Just to clarify to the committee, it's going to make no difference whether you're a party litigant or you're represented by counsel in the, in the court of session and whether your appeal goes to the Supreme Court. The court of session will make the decision whether it goes up, failing which the Supreme Court. That's the kind of clarification. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to conclude the meeting, uh, the, not the meeting, oh, I wish I could, uh, <laughs> concluding that item, and we now move into private session. Thank you very much for your evidence, Minister, and I'll suspend for a couple of minutes for you all.